Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Micah Schwartzman. I'm the co-director of the Karsh uh, Center for Law and Democracy, and I want to welcome you uh, to this program, which is entitled The 14th Amendment, When Should a Presidential Candidate Be Disqualified? Before I introduce our panelists, let me say a brief word about the Karsh Center for Law and Democracy and the Karsh Institute of Democracy, which are co-sponsoring this event. The Karsh Center was established at the law school in 2018 as a nonpartisan legal institute. Its mission is to promote the understanding and appreciation of the principles and practices necessary for a well-functioning pluralistic democracy, including civil discourse, civic education, and citizenship, ethics and integrity in public office, and respect for the rule of law. Founded in 2021, just a few years after the law school's uh, center, the Karsh Institute of Democracy has elevated the university's commitment to understanding, defending, and reinvigorating the institutions and practices and cultural underpinnings that are the foundations of democracy. Through robust interdisciplinary research and teaching and vibrant programs and partnerships designed to engage uh, the public and influence uh, policy agendas, the Karsh Institute is shaping a thriving democratic future. Our topic today could not be more central to the missions of the Karsh Center and the Karsh Institute. As you know, on Thursday, the Supreme Court will hear oral argument in Trump v. Anderson, in which it will confront the question whether former President Donald Trump can be excluded from the ballot on the grounds that he engaged in insurrection against the Constitution of the United States in violation of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. The issues in this case are momentous and historic. It is no exaggeration to say that they go to the heart of the rule of law and to the future of democracy in our nation. Today's event, which is being recorded by our partners at VPM, will examine the legal, historical, and political arguments raised in this case, including what we might expect from the Supreme Court later this week. To help us work through these issues, uh, we have with us uh, two distinguished jurists, um, and let me begin uh, with Judge Michael Ludig, um, who recently joined us as a distinguished fellow in law and democracy, an inaugural position co-sponsored by the Karsh Institute and the Karsh Center. This is a homecoming for Judge Ludig, who graduated from the School of Law at UVA in 1981, and we're thrilled to welcome him back to the university. Judge Ludig served on the US Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit for 15 years, from 1991 to 2006. Before his appointment to the federal bench by President George H.W. Bush, he served as Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel at the U.S. Department of Justice and as Counselor to the Attorney General of the United States. From 1981 to 1982, he was Assistant Counsel to the President at the White House under President Ronald Reagan. From 1982 to 1983, he was law clerk to then Judge Antonin Scalia of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and then a law clerk and special assistant to Chief Justice Warren Burger in the US Supreme Court. After retiring from the bench, Judge Ludig was executive vice president and general counsel of Boeing from 2006 to 2020. He currently serves on the board of trustees for the National Constitution Center and is counselor and special advisor to the Coca-Cola Company. On a personal note, I wanted to add that I clerked on the Fourth Circuit the year that Judge Ludig uh, retired from the federal bench and I had a chance to see him in action then uh, during oral argument at the court sittings in Richmond. His tenacity for legal argument and his demand for rigor and clarity were daunting back then, and I expect you'll see much the same today. Um, those virtues are undiminished for you, Judge Ludig, and we're fortunate to have you back at the university. Judge Ludig is joined by Kurt Lash, who holds the E. Claiborne Robbins Distinguished Chair in Law at the University of Richmond uh, School of Law, where he teaches and writes about constitutional law. He's the author of several works of constitutional history, including the 14th Amendment and the Privileges or Immunities of American Citizenship, published by Cambridge University Press, The Law's History of the Ninth Amendment, published by Oxford University Press, and a two-volume collection of original documents relating to the framing and ratification of the Reconstruction Amendments, including the 14th Amendment, published by the University of Chicago. He's currently working on a book forthcoming from Yale entitled A Troubled Birth of Freedom, The Struggle to Amend the Constitution in the Aftermath of the Civil War. 
Professor Lash's work has appeared in numerous law journals, including the Stanford Law Review, Georgetown Law Journal, the Notre Dame Law Review, and our own Virginia Law Review. Professor Lash is an elected member of the American Law Institute and the founder and director of the Richmond Program on the American Constitution. Our discussion today will be moderated by Melody Barnes, who is executive director of the Karsh Institute of Democracy, a senior fellow of the Karsh Center for Law and Democracy at the law school, and an affiliated faculty member at the law school. During the administration of President Barack Obama, she was assistant to the president and director of the White House Domestic Policy Council. She was also executive vice president for policy at the Center for American Progress and chief counsel to the late Senator Edward M. Kennedy on the Senate Judiciary Committee. She was previously director of legislative affairs for the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and assistant counsel to the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Civil and Constitutional Rights. Thank you for joining us today, and I'll hand things over now to Mel. Great. Thank you. Well, Micah, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And I want to thank all of you all for being here this afternoon. Uh, to sit where the three of us are sitting and to look out and see you, I, am, I have to say I thought, you often see a packed house for Taylor Swift. <laughs> but to see a packed house for the Constitution is really gratifying. So thank you so much for being here. And I, I particularly want to thank Judge Ludig and Professor Lash from joining, for joining us as well. I think we're all here because we know that Trump v. Anderson is a consequential case. And its implications for our democracy are significant. We are fortunate to have two experts share their point of view, their different points of view, about the issues and the questions before the court. But before we dive into the conversation, I actually have a question for you all. How many people here have actually witnessed a Supreme Court argument? Okay, we have a few. Um, I just want to set the stage then for those who haven't been to the Supreme Court, which is a really wonderful experience. Um, the justices and their clerks will be well versed in the issues before they walk into that courtroom on Thursday. In addition to the briefs from the petitioner, former President Donald Trump, and the respondent, Norma Anderson, and another a group of other respondents, they will have received over 50 briefs from everyone from members of Congress to the Republican National Committee, to the NAACP Legal Defense from Professor Lash, Judge Ludig, and his colleagues, and a whole host of others. And they will have read those briefs to prepare for the argument in front of them. The petitioner's lawyer will have about 40 minutes to address the court. The respondent's lawyers will have for another 40 minutes, divided 30 minutes, for Norma Anderson and 10 minutes for another respondent. And during those arguments, it, it isn't like uh, the courtroom dramas that we're used to seeing on TV. It looks a little less linear. They will immediately, probably, start to get peppered by questions from the nine justices. And the justices are trying to deepen their understanding of the arguments. They're often trying to test their theories. And in some cases, they're trying to persuade their colleagues um, to move in a particular direction as they're asking those questions. And the question, as Micah described for us, is whether or not the Colorado Supreme Court erred in determining that former President Trump should not be on the primary ballot in Colorado. Um, that question or that issue has beneath it a whole set of other questions. Um, one, did the former president engage in insurrection? Um, two, interpretations of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Um, a question was, is the president an officer? Whether or not the section was uh, drafted to focus on state-level activity. Whether or not uh, the 14th Amendment, that section requires enforcing legislation and other kinds of questions before the court. So that's what Thursday will look like and sound like. And now I want to give both Professor Lash and Judge Ludig an opportunity, a few minutes, to share with you their view of the issue and how the case should be determined. 
Before I turn to them, I do just want to give you all one short reminder. We will have an opportunity for you all to ask the two of them questions. We'll do that by putting QR codes in front of, you'll see them on the screens, and use those QR codes to share your questions. And then we will have a wonderful UVA student, so it won't be me, a wonderful UVA student select questions and ask questions on your behalf. So I'll remind you again shortly before we go to Q&A. But with that, I want to turn to you, Professor Lash and Judge Ludig, to share your thoughts about the case, the questions that you think, the important issues, and why, and I'll start with you, Professor Lash, why you believe that the Colorado Supreme Court erred in its decision. Of course. Uh, Melody, thank you so much. Uh, my thanks to the Karsh Institute for putting together this uh, this wonderful event and inviting me to uh, to play a to play a role, Mike. I'm very I'm very happy to report that my most recent law review article is going to be published by the Virginia Law Review, um, and so special um, thanks to them. And what an honor to share the stage with Judge Ludig, and uh, who we just met uh, met for the for the first time. And you get a sense in the difference of of expertise. Notice that I have notes on my lap, and he does not. Okay. <laughs> I'm not taking any chances. All right. In, in, in terms, in terms of how how this, how this goes. Okay. So why do I believe that um, the Colorado Supreme Court's decision should be reversed? All right. The question, the question before the Supreme Court, and it's going to be argued this, this week. The question before the court is not whether or not um, the president holds an office, but it's a more specific question. It's a question as to whether or not the president holds a civil office under the United States. And this is a much more difficult and historically complicated question. And in the brief that I've just submitted to the Supreme Court, I argue that the phrase is capable of more than one meaning and that the ratifiers did not resolve the ambiguous meaning of the text. And so therefore it would be inappropriate for the court to apply the text in a way that would disqualify Donald Trump. Now in about four minutes, and I promise only four, I'm gonna to try to explain why I think that's the case. Right. The 14th Amendment itself, and do not hesitate at any moment to Google the 14th Amendment if you'd like to do so. Uh, the 14th Amendment is full of broad words that are restricted by longer legal phrases. Uh, the Due Process Clause, for example, does not just speak of liberty, it speaks of persons deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, a longer phrase. Similarly, the Privileges or Immunities Clause, which begins the 14th Amendment, it doesn't just speak of privileges. It speaks of privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, a longer legal phrase. In the same way, uh, Section 3 talks about not just offices, it also talks about offices, civil or military, under the United States. And that particular clause, just like the Due Process Clause and the Privileges or Immunities Clause, even prior to the adoption of the 14th Amendment, had received significant legal uh, construction in the decades prior to 1868. So at the, at the time of the 14th Amendment, well-established congressional precedent and legal authority defined that phrase, civil office, under the United States, as referring to appointed offices and not the apex government positions of senator, representative, or president of the United States. That precedent emerged out of an early case, something called Blunt's case in 1799, and it was the authoritative view of Joseph Story in his commentaries on the Constitution a source that was repeatedly used by the members of the 39th Congress that framed Section 3. This was also the view of key Republicans in the Reconstruction Congress. Lyman Trumbull, one of the framers of Section 3, in the debates over the ironclad oath, declared that a phrase declaring any office of honor or profit under the government of the United States, either civil or military, was a phrase that should be read as not including the President of the United States. Although an early draft of Section 3 expressly named the President in its opening words, the final draft did not. Instead, as you can see, and I'm very glad that the words are actually available for you to look at, instead the draft lists specific offices and then methodically moves from the high offices of Senator and Representative 
down to a general catch-all phrase that references what everyone agrees would be lower federal and state appointed offices. This structure naturally reads as if the drafters expressly named all the high offices they wish to include, and they did not include the president. Now, as I explained in my brief, it is textually possible to read this phrase as including the office of the president, but it is not necessary to read it that way. The text was ambiguous, and the ratifiers could have read it either way. And unfortunately, nothing in the historical record suggests that the ratifiers resolved this ambiguity one way or another. Nor is there any reason to think the ratifiers would have thought the issue was important to resolve. No one in Congress at the time worried about the nation electing Jefferson Davis as President of the United States. Instead, Republicans faced a real and imminent danger arising out of state-level pockets of Southern disloyalty. Influential rebels might exploit their remaining local popularity and secure appointment to the Senate, election to the House, or position as a state presidential elector. Once in office, these obstructionist Democrats and former rebels would join forces with their Northern counterparts and either block the enactment of federal legislation on civil rights or help to elect a Northern Union Democrat like Horatio Seymour as President of the United States. Section three reasonably and successfully addressed all of these very real concerns without having to go further and needlessly abridging the right of the national electorate to choose their president. So in sum, because the text can be read as excluding the president, and because we have no evidence that the ratifiers thought otherwise, I believe the Supreme Court should reverse the decision below and let the people decide for themselves whether or not to elect Donald Trump. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lash. Judge Ludic, I want to bring you in now to share your, your view of the Colorado State Supreme Court decision. Judge Lash has made the point, the language is ambiguous, officer was not defined to include the president. Um, and I think, um, and Professor Lash can correct me if I, I'm misspeaking, at the very end raises the point that this is perhaps undemocratic um, or anti-democratic um, for the court to make the decision to take the former president off the ballot. But please tell us what you think. Thank you, Melody, and thank you, uh, Karsh Institute. Uh, and the Karsh Center and MICA. Um, th th this is truly an honor for me to be here today. Uh, it's uh, an honor not just to be here with the Karsh Institute, but specifically to be here in the Rotunda. Uh, for 30 or 40 years, I've wondered to myself uh, what it would be like to speak in the rotunda. <laughs> and and I, I said to myself over those 40 years, if I ever uh, had that opportunity, I would not blow it. <laughs> um, and that's why I did not bring notes to this conversation. <laughs> um, but I, I, I'm not going to, uh, to, to debate with the professor or Melody today uh, about the meaning and scope of the uh, Section Three of the Fourteenth Amendment. Um, I'm woefully inadequate uh, to do that, and I, at age seventy, I know what I don't know, so I'm not going to, to debate it. For the same reason that I would not argue this case in the Supreme Court, that reason and many others, and, and incidentally, but uh, but I, I came armed. Um, no, I didn't come armed. Uh, I am now armed after listening to Professor Lash with the answer uh, to, to the question of the application of uh, the 14th Amendment to the former president. Uh, and he's not anticipating this rejoinder, but this will decide the case. <laughs> um, I, I have the the honor and the distinction, some would say dubious, uh, that three, if not four, of my former law clerks 
have represented the President of the United States since January 6, 2021. And two of those three, most recently, are representing the, uh, the former president for the D.C. Circuit on, the, on his claim of absolute immunity to prosecution. Uh, that decision, by the way, was decided moments before we, uh, we came here. And then the second of the three uh, law clerks, hapless law clerks, <laughs> as the great Justice Scalia once dubbed them, uh, Thursday will we'll represent the president, former president of the United States in the Supreme Court, uh, arguing that he's not disqualified uh, under uh, the 14th Amendment. So to my point, the obvious point I submit, um, Professor Lash believes that the president's not even subject to the 14th Amendment, much less that he's disqualified under the 14th Amendment. And he is tracking very closely the arguments that my law clerks are making on behalf of the former president. For that reason alone, <laughs> I have concluded that the president is emphatically disqualified <laughs> under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Now, uh, to get a little more serious, uh, th th this is uh, this case, uh, Trump versus Anderson, uh, is a test of America's commitment to American democracy, to the Constitution, and to the rule of law. America must not fail this test. And it goes without saying, the Supreme Court of the United States must not fail this test. If the Supreme Court of the United States rules that the former president is not disqualified by the 14th Amendment, and it doesn't embrace some legitimate off-ramp to the contrary conclusion. I believe it will, it will deal a blow to the Constitution of the United States and the rule of law in America. Um, I packed a lot of, into that last phrase intentionally let me unpack a little bit of it. Um, I said legitimate off-ramp. There are legitimate off-ramps that the, the Supreme Court could, could take to a decision that the former president is not disqualified today. But I've said publicly that I do not believe that there is an off-ramp eventually to a conclusion that the former president is disqualified under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And, and that, is a, that is a conclusion that, that uh, subsumes all of the questions that, uh, that Melody um, uh, recited for us, in fact, her recitation was so beautiful that I, I'm going to propose that she argue the case Thursday. <laughs> uh, but, but in case you weren't listening to her, uh, the, the questions under, under the 14th Amendment that well, the Supreme Court now must be decide, decide are very simple questions. That's one of the beauty of this case. One of the beauties of this case, that rarely in American history has a case first engaged the population as this case. 
But as importantly as the reason for that, the 14th Amendment is accessible to the American people. And here's what all of you and the rest of the country know. It, what it does is it disqualifies any person from future high office, both in the United States and in the respective states, who, having taken an oath to support the Constitution of the United States, then engages in an insurrection or rebellion against the Constitution of the United States. It does not by its terms, and this is something you must understand, it does not disqualify one who engages in an insurrection or rebellion against the United States or even the authority of the United States. Rather, it disqualifies one who engages in insurrection or rebellion against the Constitution of the United States. This was the very first thought that I had when I first read Section 3 three and a half years ago, before January 6, 2021. And I have agonized over that point for the past three years until I was so absolutely certain of that critical distinction that I went public with it. And so today, all of the briefs in the Supreme Court admit and acknowledge that it disqualifies one who engages in an insurrection against the Constitution, okay? And so then the next thought that I had to have, of course, as you would have, is, well, what insurrection against the Constitution? No one else was even thinking about that. Everyone else just assumed, or, or not, that he had engaged in an insurrection against the United States via his attack on the United States Capitol in order to, to uh, prevent the, the joint session from counting the electoral votes for the presidency on January 6th. That, I, I, I believe, would constitute uh, as such an insurrection against the Constitution, in addition to an insurrection against the United States. But I had to decide what is the Constitution of the United States? What is the insurrection against that? And it took me many, many months, but I finally, you know, like a light bulb, I, 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 I thought, oh my God, it's right, plain as the nose on, on on our constitutional faces. Under what's called the executive vesting clause, the president only serves for four years. And then he must submit himself or herself to the American people to be reelected. And if he's not, And he, if he tries to remain in power, notwithstanding that he had been not been elected by the vote of the American people and prevents the peaceful transfer of power for the first time in American history, he has engaged in an insurrection against the Constitution. 
the executive vesting clause, and the 12th and 20th amendments. And so that's what I have, have written. Uh, I first raised it in a brief in the DC circuit, DC district court on the immunity question. And in that context, uh, a, a, a number of my uh, distinguished former co colleagues in six Republican administrations wrote that a president is never immune from federal prosecution after he leaves the office, never, under any circumstance. But if there is one single circumstance in which a president can never be immune from federal prosecution, it's when he leads an insurrection against the Constitution of the United States in palpable violation of the Executive Vesting Clause, the 12th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, and the 20th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. If, if, if that person is immune from federal prosecution, then a president is immune from all, all prosecution for any and every criminal act committed against the United States of America while he or she was in office. And just, yes. Judge Ludi, can I just, because yeah. I, before we continue, I want to make sure that the argument that you're making is clear. And if I understand you correctly, and, and Professor Lash, I also want to get your response to this, that the act that you are focused on, the insurrection against the US Constitution, it was the act of trying to stay in office beyond the four-year term as designated under the, Consti under the Constitution. Exactly. And so, Professor Lash, I'm, I'm curious about your response to that and the, the, dis the distinction that I hear Judge Ludig making and also that final point that I heard and I thought tried to tease out about your belief, given that and given the primacy of the Constitution, can that still be an anti-democratic act um, to determine that the president should be removed from the ballot based on what Judge Ludig is arguing? Okay, and th th thank you. I'd, I completely agreed with, uh, with Judge Ludig that what is, um, what is targeted here um, involves insurrection or rebellion against the Constitution of the United States. That isn't completely clear from the text. You, you kind of have to read it through a couple of times, and I'm not sure everyone agrees with us, Judge, but I think that you have the correct, I think you have the correct reading there. And it certainly makes sense in terms of my study of, of the Civil War, that their view of what, at what had happened, this was not a whiskey rebellion. This wasn't, this wasn't some type of, of um, ordinary refusal to pay taxes or something along those lines. The secession of the southern states was a breaking up of the union, the union that it was spoken into being, you know, by the by the federal constitution. So it was a betrayal of the people's constitution itself that they were, uh, that I think they were targeting. That makes sense to to, to my understanding of of the history. Um, in now, of course, then the, then the question the question then becomes. Uh, an additional uh, issue before the court will be whether or not that riot on January 6th counted as an insurrection or rebellion against, um, against the Constitution of the United States. And once again, I think you're looking, you're looking at a term that can be read in different ways. Of course it can be read, um, and in a very broad kind of way, uh, to include any type of resistance against the ordinary transfer, the peaceful transfer of power. And I think that I think the judge has a good, has a good argument there. But I'm, I'm an originalist, and an originalist knows that our thoughts about words are not always the same thoughts of those who actually uh, drafted the clause and ratified it. 
And I think there's a, um, an unresolved question as to whether or not that entire phrase, again, you don't just look at the word insurrection. It's a larger phrase than that, insurrection or rebellion against the Constitution of the United States, whether or not they had in their minds something far, um, far more insidious and far more catastrophic, something along the lines of a civil war that had resulted in the deaths of 600,000 American soldiers and led to extraordinary death and destruction and involved the execution of the surrendering black soldiers at Fort Pillow and the starving to death of American soldiers at Bell Island or Andersonville. I mean, the, the civil war and insurrection and rebellion that they were dealing with was on a level of death and destruction unheard of um, in American history. And there's a question as to whether or not when they looked at those words, it had a, um, a much larger meaning, one that would transcend um, what happened on, on January 6th. This is not an issue that I have explored myself, but I do know that it's an issue that the court is likely to ask questions about uh, this coming Thursday. And, and Judge Ludig, to, to pick up on that, and also this question of ju judicial philosophy, and judges walk into the courtroom um, with a way that, an approach to the Constitution. Judge um, Professor Lash has said, I'm an originalist, and therefore, this is the way that I'm looking at this language. I know Judge Ludig, in your brief, um, along with other colleagues, you talked about, you described the textualist approach to this. And I also read that as an appeal because you are quoting uh, former Justice uh, Scalia and others, an appeal to uh, members of the court uh, to use that particular approach. Tell us what you are thinking when you hear Professor Lash describe an insurrection, the view an originalist would take to the language of insurrection, and the approach that you're, you all have argued that the, co the court should take um, as a textualist. Uh, Melody, let me, let me uh, uh, first go back and answer your, your, your question about uh, whether disqualification is anti-democratic. The Constitution itself tells us that disqualification is not anti-democratic without more, just your common sense, okay? But it actually all but explicitly tells you that. That is, the Constitution tells us that. How? It says that disqualification is not what's anti-democratic. What's anti-democratic is the conduct that can give rise to disqualification. That's like logic 101, but it's also Constitution 101. Uh, now, to, you, to your question, um, uh, despite the fact that the entire world believes that I, I, I am an originalist uh, in, in interpreter of the Constitution, I'm not. I've never been um, for reasons that don't matter today. But um, this whole conversation began with uh, the first comprehensive research and analysis of the 14th Amendment, Section 3, by professors Bode and Paulson. And their article actually hasn't even published yet. Uh, but of course, we all have access to it. They are professedly not just conservatives, but originalists. And so they expressly analyzed whether the former president's disqualified under the 14th Amendment through the lens of an originalist. Why? Probably because they knew that maybe a simple majority of the court today regards themselves as, as originalists. I don't know. But in any event, that's the analysis. Okay? And that analysis has now, with the case teed up for argument, that analysis has now been magnificently filled out by the greatest legal minds and constitutional minds in, in our history. Uh, and one of them, uh, 
whom I just met the other day, is here with us today. Uh, and, and his name is James Heilpert. And, and James Heilpert and, and, and his colleague, uh, Michael Worley, have written what I now consider the definitive paper on the meaning of the phrase officer of the United States in Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. They, too, have gone back into all of history in search of the original meaning and understanding of the words that eventually made their way into Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. As a footnote, they concluded that officer of the United States at the time unmistakably meant, included the President of the United States. Another footnote, a point that Justice Scalia actually agreed with them on a decade ago. Okay. Uh, but uh, so, I, since I'm, I've, I've now confessed not to be an originalist <laughs> for the first time publicly, um, uh, what, I, what I am in a position to say to you today is that there is no question uh, in, in this world that under an originalist understanding and interpretation of the words of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment that the former president is disqualified. It's incidentally also the case that under a plain textualist reading, uninformed by the originalist meaning, that the former president is disqualified. I, I know, Professor Lash, you want to jump back in here. I saw that, that signal. I want to add another question, though, for you all both to consider. You know, we've been talking about interpretation of the language of the 14th Amendment. We've been talking about the question of whether or not uh, to leave the former president off of the ballot would be anti-democratic, these issues that the court will be considering. I'm curious if you all can give us kind of an early peek into what you think we should listen for when the case is argued. I mean, what kinds of questions should we listen for from the various justices? What might give us a sense of what direction the court might take based on the argument that we hear on Thursday. So Professor Lash, I'll turn to you. I know you wanted to um, add something, but I'm also asking you all to, I'll to give I, us- I'll uh, see if I can catch up, yeah. right, and get to, get to all, because these are great, Melody, these are, these are important questions. Um, as to get back to your, um, your earlier question about whether or not disqualifying uh, Donald Trump would be anti-democratic, my answer to that is that it depends. If, if it is constitutionally justified, to disqualify Donald Trump, then it's not anti-democratic at all. I mean, it's no different than a 35-year age requirement or having to be a natural-born citizen. On the other hand, if it's not constitutionally justified to disqualify Donald Trump, then it would be profoundly anti-democratic to prevent the country, at least half of the country, um, from voting for their choice of precedent. So it depends, that, that anti-democratic point depends upon whether or not it's constitutionally justified. This then brings us to how do you know what's constitutionally justified? And, and Judge Ludig claims that he's not an originalist, and I believe him. Um, but I very much agree with the statement in his brief that he submitted to the Supreme Court that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment must be interpreted according to the understanding of the ratifiers. I think that's exactly right, and that's all originalists are really trying to do is try to enforce what the sovereign people themselves thought they were doing at the time that they, uh, that they adopted constitutional, constitutional text. And so that's why an investigation of history is, is so important. And that's why in this particular case, I think it's so important that we have nothing but silence uh, from the ratifiers regarding their understanding of whether or not uh, the Office of President is included. Now, I think I can get now to your question about what do I predict the court? 
Um, what what should we when we are reading recount a uh, recounting of the argument and you hear you know Justice Gorsuch asks X Y and Z or Justice Kagan asks right. A B and C, right. what what do you think that will tell us about where we might might go? Mel Melody, let me just uh, add to to uh, to what Professor Lash said. Uh, the Constitution itself is, in many of its provisions, anti-democratic. <laughs> okay? That's, that's not even debatable, right? Uh, think of the largest way in which it's anti-democratic in the protection of our constitutional rights against democratic conduct that would deny us our constitutional rights. So not only in that way, but many others. So th that this involves democracy and that even if you assume that, that the, 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 uh, the Supreme Court disqualifies him, it's of no special constitutional moment that that decision could be characterized as undemocratic. Uh, so that, that's just to set the larger context for you before we get to the, the arguments that, that we might hear on Thursday. Oh, um, the, all of these questions will be, will be coming from the court. Um, all of the justices have suggested at least an openness um, and an interest in historical investigation of constitutional text. And I think that there's a working majority of justices who go further than that. They really will want to be able to ground whatever decision they make on, on historical evidence of uh, framing and ratifier understandings. Now, the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, I, Judge Ludig, you, pro you probably would agree with this. He, he'll be interested in the institution of the court. He'll be interested in questions that maybe can um, keep the court out of the political fray as much as possible. So he might be looking to determine uh, perhaps whether courts shouldn't be involved in this at all and that it should be left to Congress to pass enabling legislation. And until they do, the courts shouldn't be there. I think originalist justices like Justice Thomas and Justice Alito and, and Gorsuch as well will, will be asking a lot of history questions. And then as I was thinking about this, just one, one last one, I, I'm, I'm going to guess that Justice Kagan is going to ask federalism questions. Um, I believe that uh, Justice Kagan will be interested in whether or not the best response or the best answer would be to leave this decision to the states and allow them to decide for themselves whether or not to keep uh, Donald Trump on or off the ballot. So those are some things that I'll be, that I'll be looking for. Judge Ludic. Well, so, so from the, the narrowest to the broadest, um, what, what I will be looking for is beginning with Professor Lash's last point. Uh, I believe that under the electors clause of the Constitution, for now, just uh, that the states have the, the power and, and the right to qualify or disqualify any person for their primary ballots that they choose. I am wrestling with my doubt as to whether the states have that same right and power for purposes of the general election where they would be acting under both their the electors clause as well as the elections clauses that confer upon the states um, uh, almost uh, um, exclusive authority to conduct federal elections. I think the way I resolve that, though, is that 
that's where the federal constitution must come into play and therefore not qualify or not disqualify the former president until the Supreme Court of the United States decides whether he is actually disqualified from, from holding the office of the presidency. Then I think that uh, that would be what I've called a legitimate off-ramp for the Supreme Court to decide this one case. First, this is a case about Colorado's primary ballot. Answer, under the electors clause of the Constitution, they can do whatever they want. Of course, that would leave for another day the big question. And the Supreme Court would have to address that within months after this decision, if not sooner. But legitimately under the Constitution, the Supreme Court decide that. Then I think once they get through that uh, nettlesome uh, uh, group of constitutional issues, I think that the, the first uh, or in order of importance issue that they'll come to is, is, the, uh, is a president, an officer of the United States, and is the office of president an office under the United States? Uh, and then I do expect, uh, regardless of the, the time uh, for the court to, to uh, explore whether di uh, disqualification qualification is, is, would be anti-democratic, and then Last, I, and I, I would never uh, predict that the Supreme Court would ever acknowledge this issue. But of course, we all know that the issue is there. Namely, if the court were to disqualify the former president, would it lead to uh, violence? in the streets of, 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 of our country. Uh, that that non-legal and non-constitutional concern should not play any role whatsoever in the court's decision. But it would not mean that it played a role in its decision were it to ask questions about that possibility, um, and uh, that would be a momentous day in the Supreme Court of the United States. I want to turn your attention to the screens. The QR codes are up, so please, I see phones being held up, so please share your questions with us. I'm going to ask one more question. You all have both talked about the kinds of questions that you think the court will focus on, that the justices may focus on. You've obviously both shared, and thank you so much, your view of the argument. I am curious, and Judge Ludig, I think you were saying this a little bit, but setting your own views aside, where, how do you think the court will come down on this question? And, and this goes to one of your final points, Judge Ludig. Will, do you think it will be clear when we get that decision, probably fairly soon, whether or not the former president will be on the ballot or is there another off-ramp? And you were talking a bit about off-ramps, but where do you think, your opinion aside, just being court watchers and experts in the law, where do you think the court will likely come down? And, and what do you think that might mean? Yeah, I, I feel the need to say that no one really cares what Professor Lash and I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would say uh, the audience here, gathered here, but, says something a little bit different. But nor should they. <laughs> um, we're just, just like all of you. We're just looking at the Supreme Court to, to answer the question. We just happen to have a little bit more 
knowledge than you do, and Professor Lash has a lot more than I do, okay? But um, uh, I, I do have a little more experience than Professor Lash in judging. Uh, and the Supreme Court of the United States in particular, always, without exception, looks to decide the case on the narrowest basis possible. I say always. It always looks for the narrowest basis. When it finds that narrowest basis here, it will be that the states have the prerogatives for purposes of primaries to disqualify a former president or not. So they would affirm the Colorado Supreme Court, which disqualified the former president from the prime state's primary ballot. Um, but like we talked about, as they did that, it would be a wholly unsatisfactory to the nation. And the Supreme Court would understand that. Now, I have addressed publicly the argument that chaos would ensue. If the court were to, to, to affirm the Colorado Supreme Court on that basis, there would be no chaos that would ensue. Uh, there would be uh, a lot of chaotic chatter uh, among the political class for at most a few days until intelligent people like all of you told them that well actually the Supreme Court just decided the case that it had before it and you know don't worry about it we'll now have a primary where Various states will disqualify the former president and various won't. So what? If I were deciding the case and I were decided to decide it that way, I would reason and be thinking that that is one step closer to preserving American democracy before and unless and until I had to decide whether Donald Trump was actually disqualified. So, you know, you get what you pay for. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Lash. Uh, Again, I'm very anxious to get to the questions that, that people have, so I'll, I'll just answer very briefly that I have full faith in the former clerks of Judge Ludig that they, <laughs> that they will prevail. And, and I don't. <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, we will take questions from the audience. Where is Nikki? Ah, there we go. All right, this question is from Sarah McClellan. If the president is not an officer of the United States under the Constitution, what other implications does that determination have? If the president is an offer, isn't no. an officer, if, if, what if, other implications? If the president is not an officer of the United States, where the, where the, then Donald Trump wins uh, in, the, in the case. Um, I don't. Now, in terms of how that would play interstitially with all the other phrases in the Constitution, many of which talk about offices and some involve the president and, and some don't, is a hugely um, complicated issue that I, I think just in the past four months has, um, has resulted in about two and a half thousand pages of law review, uh, law review writing. It actually is not... It's not my position. It's not one that I that I write about. I think the president um, does hold an office. I think the president is an officer um, of the United States. Notice, all of a sudden, I become a lawyer, but he's not a civil officer under the United States. And my proposition is that those words, actually, although maybe not to our ears, 
but to the ears of those who drafted the 14th Amendment have very peculiar meaning. And I expect the court will grapple with that. So I think, I think the court could conclude that, yeah, the president has, has an office, of course, but that doesn't mean that he fell within this specific term of art. Well, let me give you the cliff note version of, of the issue uh, that cuts across all of the various provisions in the Constitution that talk about election, appointment, and choosing, okay? The question is whether the president, for every one of those, is either elected or appointed. Um, it would take us the rest of the afternoon to explore that, but that's the therein lies the answer. That's what I can tell you today. Next question. Given the 230 plus years history of the Constitution, have there been any other cases where the question of the president of the U.S. is an officer of the United States? Well, uh, the biggest argument that my former law clerks um, uh, have, have made, and, uh, and, and I think it was just yesterday that I said that they had fatuously made, which just means silly, uh, is that because the president in their ill-informed view is not an officer of the United States under the appointments clause, which clause simply says that the president shall appoint all officers of the United States, then a fortiori, say my hapless law clerks, He's never an officer of the United States in the, in the entirety of the Constitution of the United States. Well, that's the kind of argument that law clerks make. Uh, <laughs> but they only make those when they're one year out of law school. That's, that's harsh, Judge. That's very... <laughs> Very, I'm really getting the funny. feeling of what it would, was like to be <laughs> Judge Ludic's clerk. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I was I was just a clerk, and I'm I'm going through really bad traumatic memories right now. But my, <laughs> I mean, PTSD, my, Professor Lash. To to me, let me let me give you just a, a brief example of how difficult an issue this this really is. In my pocket constitution, right? Everyone should have one or or have an app, and I'm in. I'm here in Article 2, it's about the, the presidency, and um, Article 2, Section 4, has to do with impeachments, okay? And here's, here's how it reads, and again, I tell my students, I tell audiences this, Google this, okay? You can look at it while I'm, while I'm actually reading it. The president, vice president, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office and on, on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, high crimes, and misdemeanors. Now notice how it's phrased. The president, vice president, and who else? Civil officers of the United States. The, the text indicates that the president and vice president are not civil officers of the United States. That in fact was exactly how it was read in Blount's case in 1799, and that's exactly what Joseph Story declared expressly in his commentaries on the Constitution. So it, the words now, there are, it's not a, a complete argument, there's back and forth, but you've got a text here that suggests that maybe those words were used in unique ways and that they might have particular meanings that go with particular clauses that don't always apply equally with other, with other texts. It's very difficult and that's why there's so many, so many thousands of pages being written on it right now. So what I would say to my law clerks when they would read me that exact phrase from the Constitution is this, pretending to be a judge at the time, I would say, counsel, 
I agree with what you just read from the words of the Constitution of the United States. And for that reason, I rule that the president is an officer of the United States. And he's the judge. <laughs> I was the judge. <laughs> well, I don't know. I have no pretenses now of anything. <laughs> Nikki. All right. This question is from James Helper. I want to ask about the argument that the 14th Amendment is not self-executing, i.e. whether there needs enabling le legislation. Is there enabling legislation to enforce the 22nd Amendment? or enabling legislation to enforce the other qualifications for president, such as age, natural born citizen, et cetera? If not, are states prohibited from keeping President Obama or Arnold Schwarzenegger on the ballot? And if there is enabling legislation, could Congress get around that by repealing the enabling legislation? And lastly, if the 14th Amendment required enabling legislation, does the 13th Amendment require enabling legislation too? I'm utterly incapable of answering that question. Again. <laughs> and I defer to, uh, to, to Professor Lash, who believes, for some reason, that it is not self-executed. Yes. Is, I've, written, I've written a larger, a larger article in which part of, the, uh, part of the argument has to do with whether or not Section 3 requires enabling legislation um, from Congress. And I guess, and, and again, it has not been the primary focus of my, of my research, but I do feel comfortable, comfortable saying some things. One, I feel, I feel very comfortable thinking that some provisions of the Constitution may be self-executing and some provisions may not be. And I think the question is particularly um, in play. I think that would be the, the, the way to put it when it comes to the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment is a very unusual amendment, and it was framed in a very unusual way. Um, it, it ended up being five sections, but in the beginning of the, 30, um, the 39th Congress, during the early months of 1866, the Joint Committee was sending very specific proposed amendments out of the Joint Committee to consideration of the rest, the rest of Congress. And some of them had to do with apportionment in the Southern states, and some of them had to do with equal civil rights, and some of them had to do with the debts that were incurred out of the, out of the Civil War. None of them got the support of the, um, or at least enough support uh, to actually become a proposed amendment. It, it didn't get to that two thirds uh, requirement. And it was only, it looked like they were going to go down into defeat. And finally, in April, they, they received some um, advice from outside of Congress. Why don't you just try bundling them all together? Even though they were written by different people for different purposes and were supposed to operate in different ways, maybe you can get everybody to come on board if you bring all of them, all of them together at the same time. This is ultimately how we get um, to a five-section amendment. And even then, we haven't gotten to Section 3. Section 3 wasn't part of the original five-section amendment by the Joint Committee. It was added at the very last minute by a, a special caucus of the Republican Senate. So, so my point here is simply that you have something that looks like a single amendment, but its different provisions may operate in different ways because really they had different genesis. Um, and so it's quite possible, for example, section one would be fully um, self, uh, ex uh, you, it would be capable of self-execution. Maybe the 13th Amendment would be capable of self-execution. Uh, maybe some provisions actually would not be capable of self-execution. And during the debates, that came up, whether or not the provisions that we were writing in this particular section would be able to execute themselves or whether or not they would require enabling legislation. Scholars are on different sides on this. I think there's evidence making it at least unclear whether or not it's subject to self-execution. Um, but the very idea that other clauses in the Constitution might be able to execute themselves, to me, doesn't answer the question about Section 3. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one last question. Please, Nikki. Okay, really quickly. If Trump is ruled disqualified, could he still be a write-in candidate? Could he still, if former President Trump is disqualified, still he could be a, could he still be a write-in candidate? Yes. He could just never hold the office of the presidency <laughs> if he were to win the write-in vote. 
the, I completely agreed with the, with the judge. Um, true. That seems like a, uh, an agreement among those who have disagreed on different issues is a great place to end this. I, I, just a couple of things. First of all, I want to say thank you so much to Professor Lash, my, uh, my Richmond neighbor, for making the trip here from Richmond um, and sharing your views and doing so so thoughtfully. Also to Judge Ludig, I think you all see why the Karsh Center and the Karsh Institute are both thrilled to have you as our distinguished practitioner fellow for the coming year. I also want to thank you all for being here, for asking such thoughtful questions, uh, for caring so deeply about these issues. We look forward to engaging with you over the course of the year on this and these and other issues. Please take a lunch um, before you leave, and thank you so much, and please join me in thanking Professor Lash and Judge Ludwig. <laughs>